ML. Bit of a boring topic these days, so let's go back to the beginning. Alright, alright, that's a bit too far. Crazy crackpipe Frenchmen started randomly distributing mail using balloons. Then during the final years of the First World War, Americans started experimenting with heavier than air machines and scheduled services. After the war ended, larger, faster aircraft became available, which allowed longer routes to be opened. Banks started to realise that they could now conduct transactions in hours or days instead of weeks and push for even longer, more frequent routes. The 1920s saw 85% of commercial air transport revenue coming from mail deliveries. Banks now started pushing for more reliable services in all weather and at night. Night flying was relatively easy, accomplished by lighting up routes with beacons and the use of new accurate altimeters but the key to all-weather flying was the introduction of gyro compasses and artificial horizons. It would be very easy at this point to get distracted and talk about how these instruments shaped the following war and civilization as a whole as they were as important to the development of aviation as the star charts and sextants were to sailing but I shall resist for now at least. The 1930s saw aircraft power plants and airframes leapfrog for pole position with navigational equipment and airmanship. But ultimately there was very little point building machines capable of flying to the other side of the world if pilots could not reliably navigate there. The airmail race finally culminated in 1937 with one nation intent on taking over the world and a manufacturer from the nation that had already taken over the world. Nazi Germany had realised the importance of fast communications while Short Brothers and Imperial Airways of England had levered themselves to the top rung of airmail by combining its post and passenger services. But the demand for new and more frequent mail routes far outstripped that of the passenger services, so smaller, lighter aircraft with greater range were required. Blom and Voss of Germany and Shorts of England both faced the same problem make a plane fly really long distances. Both companies realised if an aircraft was assisted in takeoff, it could carry a heavier load or more fuel than if it had to take off under its own power. Both companies, having drawn these conclusions independently of each other, then came up with completely different solutions. Schwartz Brothers had grown organically, first being balloon makers, then going on to be the first production aircraft manufacturer, and had focused mainly on building large passenger flying boats leading to the Empire class of aircraft. One of the most beautiful aircraft ever built. Produced for Imperial Airlines, powered by big Bristols. No, nope, the other big Bristols. Sleeve valve radial engines. They could accommodate 24 passengers in the highest possible luxury. Their experience with float planes saw them design floats for Gloucester and Supermarines Schneider Cup race entries with Reginald Mitchell's very successful Supermarine S4 leading to the Supermarine Spitfire. Blom and Voss's interest in aircraft manufacture only seriously materialised in the early 30s with the creation of their aircraft division Hamburger Flugsbau, a name very rarely used so I will refer to them as Blom Voss in the interest of keeping things simple. Already famous shipbuilders who had famously built two Derfinger class ships involved in the Battle of Jutland World War I and went on to build the most famous German battleship of all time, the Bismarck. The aircraft division was set up primarily at the demand of the Nazi party in order to increase and decentralise aircraft production, with most of Blomvoss's work comprising contract manufacturing sub-assemblies for other manufacturers, with their most numerous work being for Junkers Ju-52s. The ubiquitous trimotor used both as Hitler's personal transport and also the first airborne invasions the world ever saw. Blomvoss's creative designers, having worked on sub-assemblies, were keen to address what they considered shortcomings in the designs of the aircraft they were producing components for, and as a result created many unique machines, both in concept and construction. Their BV-238 
a heavy transport, despite having a shorter wingspan than the Hughes H4 Spruce Goose, was the heaviest aircraft ever built at the time, grossing 100 tonnes on takeoff, with many more prototypes and designs for revolutionary aircraft. However, the only machine of their design to enter serial production up to the end of the war was their BV138 trimotor reconnaissance flying boat. Blomvoss's solution to the assisted takeoff idea was to use seaplane tenders to catapult launch aircraft bigger than anyone else had previously attempted. However, as shipbuilders, their peacetime interest lay in high speed luxury vessels and never built a seaplane tender themselves. The Frieslander would be used, amongst others, with longer, more powerful catapults and cranes in order to retrieve the flying boat once it had landed. The Frieslander's catapult was rated at a massive 18 tonnes and the crane 20 tonne. With her own bunkers full and storage tanks brimming, she displaced 11,000 tonnes. The aircraft Blomvoss designed to fly longer and further than anyone else was the HA-139. Several things become apparent when looking at this machine. The designers did not intend it to take off routinely under its own power in anything more than a very mild sea. In order to minimise drag from the floats and attaching pylons, a low-mounted gullwing design was employed, putting all four props very close to the water which would presumably have led to much of the spray kicked up from the floats being right in the path of the outboard engines. The structure of the aircraft was of stressed skin, with the most notable aspect being the tubular steel main spar, which also acted as a fuel tank. A concept I have come across when working on Grumman aircraft of the 1960s vintage. Fans of the system say it's great because you'll always know if you have spar damage by the fuel leak. My opinion is that having spar damage or fuel leak are problems I'd rather experience separately, if at all. However, it saved significant weight and led to the structure of this aircraft being strong enough to withstand the high loads associated with a very unforgiving hydraulic catapult of the day, accelerating an 18 ton aircraft to 80 miles per hour in a distance of less than 60 meters or 180 foot. Power for the BV-139 came from four Junkers 205 diesel engines. After much interest from engine manufacturers around the world in producing diesels for long range flight due to their lower fuel consumption, Junkers were the only manufacturer to produce a successful diesel aircraft engine. The engines were revolutionary as they employed a biased double crank opposed piston design. The crankshaft being quite often the heaviest single component in a reciprocating engine with the need for linkage between the two crankshafts adding significantly to this weight, the Junkers design worked on the principle that 100% of the top crank power would go to the prop, 50% power from the bottom crank would go to the top crank, with all ancillaries, including the huge supercharger required to make an opposed piston two-stroke work, would be driven by the bottom crank thus reducing the loads on the drive between the two cranks. They were still relatively heavy, with an on-wing weight exceeding 700 kilos each and a continuous output of less than 500 horsepower. It's important to stress the achievement of Blomvoss and the ground or sea crew and pilots. Twin-engine cargo planes have been catapult launched off US carriers for the last 60 years now, but no one has ever routinely launched four engine machines with a catapult before or since. The BV-139, after successfully serving as a mail plane, then went on to serve successfully with the Luftwaffe as a minesweeper. The aircraft were not just launched from the tender, but fueling, maintenance and repair work was also undertaken there. The offering from the Schwartz brothers in this tale of long distance post comprises of two aircraft. First, the Empire class flying boat, more specifically the Maya, which would act as host aircraft and mounted on top of this machine for takeoff would be the Shorts S20 named Mercury. Shorts did not entertain the idea of the S20 only being able to take off in calm sea or with its host aircraft, and so 
As with all of their machines, it was built to cope with demanding conditions, with shoulder mounted wings and the floats being mounted well clear of the fuselage on long struts. The engines were also mounted in long nacelles extending relatively far in front of the wings again to keep them clear of the inevitable spray produced by the floats. The power plants selected for the Schwartz aircraft were almost polar opposites to the Junkers of the Blomvoss. They were Rapier H-block engines from the Napier company. That is the Napier Rapier, effectively two vertically opposed conventional four-stroke Avgas burning engines mated together to turn a common gearbox. The design concept for the Napier being by doubling the number of cylinders of a given displacement engine, power output would increase and frontal area would decrease. With a continuous output of 350 horsepower and on-wing weight of approximately 350 kilos, the Napier unit was far lighter for its output but burned a lot more fuel per horsepower developed. Just for comparison, the supercharged Rapier had 16 cylinders with a displacement of 539 cubic inches or 8.8 .8 litres, while a modern 540 cubic inch six cylinder Lycoming aero engine, when turbocharged, will only produce 300 horsepower continu continuously but manages to do it with a package weighing 100 kilos less on the wing. The most challenging aspect of the Mayo composite, as it was named, was separation as the host aircraft would also carry up to 18 passengers, separation needed to happen cleanly every time, and so a series of locks were employed. The first two locks would only disengage once the power sight had trimmed out, ensuring it would remain parallel upon release. The third lock would only release once a pull of 3,000 pounds was applied between the two machines, meaning the host would nose down, power sight would pull back, and the two should go in opposite directions. It worked very successfully. The Mercury was significantly smaller than the BV-139 with a maximum takeoff weight under its own power being 9 tonne. However, this soared to an impressive 12 tonne when composite launching. The truly amazing aspect of this comparison was that despite having very different influences, fuels, power plants and launch methods, the performance of the two machines was almost identical. Both had an economy cruise of 160 knots. Both had a range of approximately 5,000 kilometers. And both had a rated mail load of 500 kilos. There was no real fanfare for the achievements of any of these aircraft. The Mayo Composite set a seaplane record of 6,000 miles when it was launched heavily overloaded with fuel and flew from Scotland to South Africa. But the start of the Second World War overshadowed both of these machines, and advances in power plants, aerodynamics, and the huge number of large airfields constructed during the war meant that flying boats, seaplanes, and assisted takeoffs were unnecessary when the war ended. There were, however, some interesting developments concerning the engine manufacturers of these two machines as a result of the two aircraft. Napier saw potential in the Junkers two-stroke diesel and purchased rights for its production in England, fortunately before the war was declared. Two things happened as a result of Napier's interest in two-stroke diesels. The creation of the Napier Nomad, a gas turbine two-stroke diesel hybrid which to this day still holds the record for the most power produced from a pound of fuel in an aircraft engine. Unfortunately, it was deemed far too complex and was never considered a useful power plant. More importantly than the Napier, as far as Napier's developments from the Jungers are concerned, a request was made by the Admiralty for a high output diesel to power torpedo boats, and so Napier did what any truly unhinged design team would do and connected three double crank engines together at the cranks, meaning the number of cranks were halved and the Napier Deltic was born. With three crankshafts, 18 cylinders, 36 pistons, the Napier Deltic remains in service today, powering the ex-Royal Navy mine countermeasure ship, now in the Lithuanian service, Scalvis. The power plant also met with considerable success on British railways, where it was used to power a locomotive taking the same name, the Class 55 or Deltic. 
This was a record-breaking locomotive with almost double the power of the Atlantic class steam locomotives that had previously held the record for fastest London to Edinburgh times at six hours. The Deltic could complete this route half an hour quicker and it made a stop at York too. Each Deltic locomotive was powered by two Deltic engines. The locomotives were retired from the mid-70s onwards with the introduction of the new high-speed trains. But for over 15 years, it was the fastest thing on rails in the United Kingdom and as a result of airmail in Germany before the war. Thank you very much for watching Turbo Productions today. I hope you have enjoyed this episode and will do me a massive favour by liking this video, sharing and subscribing if you have not done so already. I have another channel, Turbo Conquering Mega Eagle, of which I make things with my own hands. And you can support my activities on YouTube by becoming a patron. Link in the description below. Thank you again, and until next time, goodbye.